Good morning, everyone. You're so welcome to this, our 9.30 service. Today's reading is going to be from the book of Revelation, and we're in chapter 7. So if you'd like to follow along, it'll be on the screen behind as well. This is God's word. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the seas or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessing that this book has been so far. Father, I thank you for the passage today, Lord, for the encouragement for those who are in Christ. Lord, that you are seated on the throne, Father, that, Lord, you have a plan for all eternity, and, God, that you're bringing that to bear here on earth. Father, thank you that salvation is in Jesus' name alone. God, I thank you for the sacrifice he made on the cross for the sins that we commit daily. I just pray now, Lord, for John as he comes to teach once more. Father, that you would just anoint him with your spirit. Pour out your spirit on this room and this building here today, Lord. Let us see with fresh eyes, God, the, the glories of your word and and the goodness of your grace. I pray for those who are in Christ, Lord, that this would be an encouragement. And I pray for those who are yet to come to know Jesus as their Savior, Lord, that today that they would hear this call. I pray for the time ahead, Lord, as we approach Advent. And Lord, I pray that it would be a time that we not only look back, but Father, we treat it as a time to long for Christ's second coming, where he will come and restore all things. And as your word says, he will wipe away every tear. Lord, pray for our kids' leaders and, and the children in their rooms here today. 
God, that Jesus would be proclaimed and, and his gospel message would be heard. And we just thank you for the work that you're doing in and through this church, Lord, and just continue to grow and, and, um, and, and draw others from our community and, and help us to go out and serve those who have a greater need than us. And Lord, we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Steph. Good morning, everyone. Again. Uh, today we are in Revelation 7. Revelation 7. Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, In this life, you will have trouble. You will have. 1 Peter. Peter says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the story of the disciple. Suffering. This is the lot of the believer. Suffering. Jesus said, you will have trouble. First Peter says, we will have trouble. Last week, in Revelation 6, what we saw was this, this very thing playing out in the history of mankind that those who follow Jesus would have trouble. The four horsemen, can you remember? Those who come in His name but are false, war, famine, pestilence. This is our reality. This is the world's reality. That's our lot. The fifth seal, after the four seals were opened, the fifth seal was opened, and under the altar the martyrs were crying, How long, O Lord, until you avenge us, until you avenge your name? How long? And then the sixth seal was opened, and judgment came upon the world. What we have today is a very interesting passage. What we have in Revelation 7 is this break in the opening of the seals. What you have is the first six of the seals being opened fairly, you know, straight after each other, and then you have a break, and chapter 7 comes in. And what we have is this, like, interval between the opening of the sixth seal and the seventh seal. Who can remember, if you've got your Bible in front of you, you'll be able to see, who can remember what the question that was asked at the end of last week the question that is posed at the end of chapter 6 is this, who can stand? Who can stand? Chapter 7 answers that question. Chapter 7 answers that question. This break between the opening of the 6th and the 7th seal is to answer the question, who can stand? And what it does as chapter 7 shows us that it is the people of God who will emerge from trouble, who will emerge from trials, who will emerge from, as it's put in chapter 7, tribulation, it shows us that they are the ones who will stand. So the question, who can stand, it asked at the end of chapter 6, is in response to the opening of the sixth seal. And what was that? Judgment. Judgment comes who can stand? Now, again, we need to place ourselves here in the context of the early church who would have read this letter. What are they going through? Persecution to a serious, serious degree. They're thinking, they're reading the opening of the first six scrolls and thinking it can't get much worse than this, but it's going to. But it's going to. The seals are opened, and right up to six, we see judgment. And so what chapter seven does, in fact, is takes us back to before, this is really important, chapter seven takes us back to before chapter six. It takes us back to before. You see, chapter seven begins 
And these, this is where like chapter divisions and stuff isn't really helpful. Chapter 7 begins, after this. After this I saw. And so what we would think possibly is that after the, after the opening of the sixth seal, then John sees this in chapter 7, and this is the order of things that will happen. That's not the case. When John says, after this in Revelation, after this I saw, what he's doing is ordering the things just simply as he sees them. He's not ordering them in chronological order as in history. Do you know what I mean? Do you get what I'm saying? He's not saying that after, this will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen, and then this will happen. What he's saying is, I saw this, then I saw this, and after this, I saw this. It does not mean that these things will happen in chronological order, as in the order of history. It cannot be the case, because in chapter 7, at the beginning of chapter 7, what we see is what? God withholding His judgment on the earth. What did we see at the end of chapter 6? God bringing His judgment on the earth. After this, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind might blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. What we see there is God actually holding back His judgment. And so He's going, and if we're to read this in chronological order, that can't be the case, because judgment at the end of chapter 6 has come. There's destruction on the earth. The very foundations of the earth are destroyed. And so we're going back to answer that question, who can stand? Now, what we see at the beginning of chapter 7 is God spurring, being gracious towards the earth. And so let's just pause and just say that again. I want to say this because it's important as we read through the book, and maybe you're reading on, and, and, and so it's important that we say this at this point. If you're reading on through the book of Revelation and, you're, and, you, see, and you see after this, don't automatically take that that is the chronological order that things will happen in history or in the future. It's not. It is just simply the order that John sees things in. Remember the illustration I used last week of the football match? of the many different camera angles that we have at a football game, seeing things from different perspectives. Chapter 7 is literally just seeing things from a different perspective, from the perspective before judgment comes. And we see a different angle, and we see who can stand and how they are to stand. And so last week we had these four horsemen, and now we have these four angels holding back the winds on the earth before judgment. So, who can stand? Who can stand? Chapter 7 is this telling of the story of things to come, and yet it tells the same story from different angles. As I say, winds instead of horsemen. The wind is not to blow on the earth, on the land, on the sea, or on any tree. So who can stand? This is the question that chapter 7 seeks to answer. And it seeks to answer it again. Remember the context. Remember the church. Remember the church that is listening to this. They are being persecuted. They are being beaten. They are being killed. They are being martyred for the sake of Christ. And this chapter 7 seeks to answer the question, who can stand, in a way that will bring most encouragement to the people of God. Imagine getting this letter. This is what we have to do every time we come to this letter. We have to put ourselves in the place of the early church and remember who is receiving the letter and read it through their lens. Who can stand? Well, if we look here in the very beginning of chapter 7, we see beings standing. After this, I saw four angels. What are they doing? standing. I saw four angels standing. We have the great multitude in verse 9, standing. We have the elders in verse 10, standing. We have the four living creatures, standing, because if you, you can't fall down in worship if you're not already standing. And so what we see here is there's quite a few people in this vision, in this time, standing. And what John sees is another angel having the seal of the living God. 
who is restraining the, the other angels from doing their work until this seal is placed on the foreheads of the servants of God. The judgment that is to come, the final destruction that is to come, is not to happen until all the people of God are brought home and are safe. That's very important. Think about that in the early context of the, the, the early church. What encouragement that would bring to them. They will be brought home safe. So, then I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun with a seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number. Now, I'm just going to pause there. The sealing of the servants of God, and especially the number uh, 144,000, is much debated in the church. And that's an understatement. It is much debated who they are. How are they sealed? What is going on here? And what we see here in verse 2 is another seal. We see an angel holding another seal. We have the seven seals that, that seal the scroll. But what we see here is another seal. This angel is holding another seal. Not the seal of the scroll, but the seal of God on his people. Then I saw another angel coming up out of the east having the seal of God. One commentator puts it like this, if the unsealings of chapter 6, which were the four horsemen and the martyrs and the judgment, if the four unsealings of chapter 6 had shown in history in all its terrifying prospects, the seal spoken of here has a different connotation. In chapter 6, seals 2 to 6 had unleashed evil, but here they speak of peace. this speaks of peace, protection, and promise. We put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. It's interesting that in the book of Ezekiel, it describes a similar event whereby an angel is given responsibility to identify the people of God, to mark them out before judgment comes. God identifies them and keeps them safe. Think about other instances in, in the Old Testament. Think about the markings on the doorposts as the people of God were to be marked out that the angel of death would go over them, pass over them uh, uh, in, in the final plague. You see, the reality of God's sealing on His people is this, and the reality of God's sealing on His people in the first early church and the churches that this was written to is this, the sealing of this people does not take them out of trouble. It does not take them out of trouble, but it sets them apart so that they are covered and protected and they are not eternally punished. That's your reality. If you're in Christ, that's your reality. You are sealed. You are covered. You are protected. It will not protect you from the troubles of this life or the troubles of this world, but you are eternally secure. You're eternally secure. So, how are the people of God sealed? You think about it, right? If you go to a uh, I'm just going to say one. If you go to a, the chemist and buy, like, uh, say, like one of them wee jars of like tablets or something, when you open it up, what's on it? It's sealed. It's sealed. The most annoying things in the world to get off, but but it's sealed. When you open the lid, you, you see the seal. What's that seal for? It's for a couple of things. One. It's making sure that the medication under the seal hasn't been tampered with. And it's also to provide protection. 
as it is with the seal of God. We will face trouble. As I said in my introduction, Jesus said we will have trouble, but we are protected and we are kept safe from eternal judgment. So just here, God's seal serves as God's stamp saying, this one is mine. It's genuine. It's the real thing. God's seal guarantees a marked out person cannot ultimately be harmed. And God will bring them safely home. But how are they sealed? Paul uses the language of sealing in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 13, 14, he says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed by what? The promised Holy Spirit. The promised Holy Spirit. You are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we come and acquire possession of it. To the praise of His glory. Folks, the Holy Spirit is the seal on God's people, showing us that we're genuine, showing us that we're protected, showing us that we have this imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and we are kept in this gift, that we are, this inheritance that is kept in heaven for us. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Nancy Guthrie in her book, a brilliant wee book on, on Revelation, says this, these servants of God are marked by the blood of the Lamb so that they do not face the wrath of the Lamb. Hallelujah. So this is how the people of God are sealed. They are sealed by the Holy Spirit. They are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Right. Now we're going to get into dangerous territory. This is the controversial bit of today. All right? But who are the people of God that are talked about in Revelation chapter 7? Again, there is much debate. This is probably one of the most debated chapters in Revelation. Now, if you read, do you remember we talked about the way to read Revelation? There's ways to read Revelation. One of them is to read it literally, and that would be a more futurist view. Uh, one is to read it ap apocalyptically and metaphorically, which we look at the symbols and we look at the, the metaphors that are used, and, and, we, and we read it like that. If you read this literally, and don't take into consideration several other things, you read the number here, 144,000, and you read the 12 twelves as literal Jews who will be redeemed before the end. And I understand why some people would, would do that. I get it. I see it. So John, hearing this expression, but, but John, think about this. Now, think, we need to think through this. Hearing this expression about sealing, God's people being sealed. He must expect that, that the seal of God would be all of God's people. He hears a number though, and I heard a number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Note this is really important. John hears that number. He does not see anything at this point. That's important. He hears the number 144,000. He does not see anything at this point. Right. Then he breaks the 144,000 down into 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. But if you're eagle-eyed, you will notice something about the 12 tribes. Two of them, two of the original 12 tribes of Israel, aren't there. They're not there. 
He leaves out the tribe of Dan, and he leaves out Ephraim, while including Joseph, Ephraim's father, and Manasseh, Joseph's brother. Now, if we go back to the first service in Revelation, you will remember that I talked about numbers being deeply symbolic in the book of Revelation. So, my perspective on this is this. It is impossible to interpret seven, four to eight, literally, for, because verse four contradicts verse five and verse eight. If 144,000 are from every tribe, Surely there must have been some from Dan. Surely there must have been some from Ephraim, but they are left out. Nowhere, nowhere else in the Scriptures is the 12 tribes listed in this way. Nowhere else. Also, nowhere else in the whole of Scripture does Judah come first in the 12 tribes. Look at it there, 12,000. This is the first thing that he hears, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. Why is that? Nowhere else in Scripture are they listed like that. Why is it listed here like this? It is listed here like this because who is Jesus? The Lion of everything else comes after that. Everything else comes after that. This would indicate that everything comes after the Lion of the, or the, lion of the tribe of Judah. So what I am going to suggest, and what I believe to be true, is this entire picture is symbolic of the entire people of God. Consider the sequence of events. John hears, do not harm the earth until the, sealed, until the people are sealed, the, the servants of God are sealed. Then he hears a number of those sealed, 144,000, 12,000 from this strange list of the 12 tribes that aren't anywhere else in the, in, in the Old Testament. And then he sees. He hears this number, he hears this list, and then he sees with his eyes who? After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. From where? Every nation. From all tribes, all peoples, all languages, standing before the throne and the Lamb, clothed in white, in, in white robes. Do you see what's happening here? Can you remember the other instance where jo this happens to John? Where he, where he hears one thing and he sees something else. Remember in the throne room scene where he hears, behold the Lion of Judah. What does he see? The Lamb who was slain. He hears one thing, but he sees something else. It is deeply, deeply symbolic. And so what he, see, what he hears here is a number of the, of the 12 tribes, but what he sees is the great multitude from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. All the servants of God. To some it may sound strange to call the redeemed by the name Israel, for us to be called by the name Israel. But as we see earlier in Revelation, pictures and promises made to Abraham and to Israel are seen as fulfilled through all of God's people, through all of the redeemed. For example, John calls his saved readers priests to our God. Jesus says in, in, to the church in Philadelphia, the one who overcomes will become a, a pillar in the temple of God. The priests were who? Only Israelites. But yet we, the church, have been grafted into this. To use Paul's language, we have been grafted in, to use the language of Romans, we have been grafted into Israel, into the people of God. Similar image in, in Revelation 7, these redeemed are said to serve Him day and night were in the temple. All of the people of God 
serving him as priests in the temple. 1 Peter, we are called a royal priesthood. We can't be a royal priesthood if we are not engrafted into the people of Israel. As I say, the people, the church, us, the redeemed, have been grafted in to use Paul's imagery. So, that's where I stand on it. You may have your opinion. That's fine. Where I see this is this being deeply symbolic of all of the redeemed for all of time being sealed by the promised Holy Spirit of God. And who, who are the ones who can stand? Them. Them. What do we see? After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our Lord. Folks, you need, you need to listen and you need to take encouragement from this. Again, think of the early context where this book is being written, where John's hearers are being persecuted, where they are being, they're, they're fearing for their lives day and night. They're being, beating, being beaten. They're put in jail. They are being persecuted flat out. They are a, sm a relatively small group of people in the world. And here we are in Rathfrylan in 2022, and the gospel has not ceased to go forward. There will be a great multitude from every tribe and every tongue and every nation standing before the throne. And if we're in Christ, we'll be there. It's an amazing, amazing encouragement for us to read this. Spurgeon says this, If there shall be in heaven a multitude surpassing all human arithmetic, because it does, he says he can't number it, all, out of all nations, all kindreds, all peoples, all tongues, how certain the gospel is to achieve a great success. Amen? Amen. 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 How great a certain. The gospel is to achieve great success. Folks, even in our situation here, there may be times where we do not seem to be making much headway. I don't know, I certainly feel that. I, as a pastor here in Rathfriend, in a small town in County Down, it certainly feels like sometimes we're not making much headway. A few individuals here and there are being brought to Jesus. But this is what we can be sure of. All the people of God will be before the throne, sealed, protected, one, delivered, secure. Not one, not one will not make it. Not one. The Lord has His people, and they will most certainly trust in Christ. And this people consists not merely of a few men, women, and children, but vast multitudes that John in this vision cannot number. He cannot number. They're before the throne. All the angels standing around the throne. What do they say? They cry with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Folks, what we have there in verse 10 is we have confirmation from all before the throne that our salvation can depend on nothing apart from our God. Our salvation can depend on nothing apart from our God. Salvation belongs to our God. There is absolutely nothing that we bring to the table. Nothing. 
When we consider our salvation, there is not one thing we add to it. No good works, no righteousness of our own, not one thing, and all before the throne know it. I think sometimes we still, in our, in our sinful human nature, we still think somehow, some way, we can add to our salvation. We can bring something to the table of some righteousness or some goodness or something. No, nothing. Salvation belongs to our God. It is a gift of grace and grace alone that any of us sit here this morning and are sealed by the Holy Spirit. It is a gift and a gift alone. And every single person before the throne knew it. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these I, 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 actually, I actually love this, love this verse. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and, where, and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. It's like almost John's being like, come on. You're winding me up here like, you know the crack. You know where they're from. You know who they are. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Folks, we discovered last week that this phrase, this great tribulation, is what? It's life. Those who will come in his name but cannot deliver war, famine, pestilence. The only ones who will survive it are those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. The only way to be saved from the tribulation is to make our robes white through His blood. And if the only way to be saved from the great tribulation is to make our robes white through the blood of the Lamb, who has made their robes white through the blood of the Lamb in here? Us, believers, Christians, those who follow Christ Jesus. That, that is us. So if that's us and we have done this, then surely we are in the great tribulation. Yes? You, you get my logic? That's where we are. Tribulation is history in general, where there is suffering and sin and war. We're in it. And how can we be saved in it? By having our robes washed through the blood of the Lamb. There are, I think, some of the most encouraging verses in Scripture between verse 15 and verse 17. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him night, day and night in the temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Let's just, let's just stop and let's just breathe and let's just read these verses together and let's take them in. Let's take these verses actually in and what they mean. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more. Think, listen, that, that, see that there? That's a struggle for us. See that there, though, to dear brothers and sisters today who have no food. Can you imagine the encouragement that, that is to them? They will hunger no more, neither thirst no more. Some of us have had the privilege of being in places where people don't have food or don't have water, and they, read, they will read these verses, and they will consider a day where they will be before the throne, and that will not be a thing for them. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of their throne will be their shepherd. Connotations of Psalm 23. And He will guide them 
to springs of living water. And possibly the most encouraging verse, or the most encouraging part of this verse is this next part. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Jesus said, in this life, we will have trouble. Peter said, we will face many various trials so that our faith would be tested. And here's the thing, we will cry. We will cry. And we will lose. And we will suffer. But there's a day coming where we will stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who took the nails for us, and he himself will wipe away our tears. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. Praise Jesus. We all know of people who suffer a great, a great deal. We suffer ourselves. The greatest news, the greatest news that those people could receive is the gospel of Jesus Christ. To know that one day, all of that will be gone. For the atheist, there is no hope. No hope. Just suffering and death. For the follower of Christ, we have the ultimate hope that every wrong will be righted. Everything that is wrong now will be right in, in glory and he will wipe away our tears. Folks, I want to finish by asking you a question this morning as we go into communion. And it's this. If I take us back to the promised seal of God, what is it? How are we sealed? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. I want us to all to ask our, ourselves a question this morning before we go, in, before we go near this table. Uh, it's this. If you are sealed by the promised Holy Spirit, there will be evidence of such. There will be evidence of such. There will be evidence in your life of the sealing of the Holy Spirit. What, are the, what is the evidence of that? It is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Now, I want us to ask ourselves the question, are we sealed? Is there evidence? And I'm not talking about perfection, as you know, but I'm talking about an evidence of sealing. Is the Holy Spirit real in your life? Is he working in your life? Is he producing more and more and more of the fruit of the Spirit? If not, we need to ask ourselves why. If not, we need to ask ourselves why. That is what it is to examine ourselves, as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. Before we come to communion, before we come to remember Christ and His suffering, Christ and His death, Christ and His atoning sacrifice for us, we need to ask ourselves the question, is there evidence of the sealing of the Holy Spirit in my life? If not, we need to ask why. If not, we need to repent and we need to turn to Jesus and we need to seek Him again and again. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to have communion together.
Father, we thank you that you have a people for yourself, a marked out, set apart people for yourself. The marking of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray for us. I pray that we would be a people who would ask you to produce the fruit in us that we need so desperately. Help us, we pray. Help us now as we worship. Help us now as we come to your table, as we remember Jesus, his body broken for us and his blood shed. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name.